Hello, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Is it okay? The sound okay? Good, excellent. So, hello. It's very nice to have you here, you all here today, uh, to our presentation, setting up a scalable continuous integration platform in hopefully less than 50 minutes. So, um, me and my colleague Rainer Birkstaller will have the presentation today, uh, and, we'll, and I'll start with the slides and guide you through the first part. So what we are going to do today is I'll give you a short motivation why we are giving this presentation here. Um, we will then present a short overview of the system that we devised. Uh, Rainer will give you a short demo and in the end we'll have time for questions and answers and hopefully a, fr a fruitful discussion. Okay, well, I, can, I will start with a short disclaimer. Um, in 50 minutes we will have um, a scalable CI system up and running, but what we will not do here is uh, doing the configuration and doing the programming as this would take a bit more time. But um, in 50 minutes, the CI system should be up and running and fully operational. Okay, um, what we assume is a basic understanding of uh, Docker and Docker Compose. So guys, now it's time to be honest, who knows Docker? Excellent, and Docker Compose? Oh, great. Nice to have you here. Good, okay. So, why are we doing this uh, presentation? Um, 10 years ago, um, the history starts for this project, um, and as every good story starts with once upon a time, when life was so much easier, so we'll start the presentation with this. And um, 10 years ago, we only had one major language on the Java virtual machine, it was Java, it was nothing else than there. Uh, we were allowed to program and to architect monoliths and we weren't even blamed for it, so we could do it. And uh, the really cool tools that we use these days were Apache Ant and Cruise Control. Um, who knows these tools right now? Who is my age class? So, okay, <laughs> good. And uh, and we even had one database, only one database, which wasn't often, very often running on our development environment or even on a staging environment, but was running on special dedicated production system and when we tried something, we had to go to this system and test it out, okay. So, and uh, what else did we have? We had these um, carefully hand-groomed and hand-crafted services and hardware infrastructure components mm -hmm. and uh, we even all kn knew their name and this was called Matilda then and uh, yeah, they were carefully groomed so that nothing happens to them and when something broke it was very terrible and we had to stay during the night fixing all this so that, that in the very next moment or the morning and the system could, uh, the developers could work again. Okay? And uh, this is uh, then where it all ended. We had those continuous integration systems where we had all these uh, um, handcrafted and manually configured jobs. And I know uh, this is just one project and after several years um, the project looked like that in Jenkins and uh, you can imagine uh, what changing a Java version or even a database would mean for the continuous integration team and when you arrive there, uh, you can ensure that you have lost and uh, better stop the project maybe, I don't know. Okay, so, but nowadays it's even getting more complicated and complex because later on you had one database, you had one continuous integration system, you had one build system, but nowadays you have all these other build systems, you have Gradle, you have Maven, you have Ant, you have different stacks maybe in your system, you have a Node.js stack, the traditional Java stack, or even a .NET stack, for example, you could have different databases and with the advent of uh, microservices, you don't have no one monolithic application, but then you have hundreds of components as well and all these have to make it into your continuous integration environment and, and later on in your production environment. Okay, um, there are further challenges you have to address um, when you are a, a smaller company like we are, 
uh, you may not have one large product where you're wa working years on, but you may have heterogeneous project sizes, so it's very small projects, but uh, which uh, should uh, also have a very nice continuous integration and continuous deployment environment. And uh, this must be very cheap because you can't afford um, such in, in a small project uh, having sp spending days and even weeks for setting up a full-fledged continuous integration environment. Nowadays, Docker should be deployed and used all the way from development or staging right now, right direct to production. And yeah, and what you want to have is that your continuous integration system not only runs in a, in a cloud-based solution like Heroku CI or OpenShift, but you want maybe to have it on your own local machines in your own uh, co-located data center. And also, it, it's always nice to be vendor independent so that you don't, don't get in problems with uh, a vendor login. Okay, and then there are other interesting things that you want for your infrastructure as well. You want to track your changes. You want to know who did what change to what component uh, when. And you also want to have the, the possibility to roll back these changes if something has broken. Maybe you decide to switch from Java 7 to Java 8 or now 9, Java 9. Then you want to test it in the branch, your complete infrastructure. And if everything then works fine, then you switch over to master and continue. And these are things that you don't only want for your code, for your applications, but that, you're, that you also want for your continuous integration environment. At least we do. So. Uh, we asked the question then, as everything broke down, uh, we asked the question, what can we do? And so we decided, why not run our continuous integration environment just as we're running our applications in the cloud? And one of the first things that you came across when you delve into this topic is uh, use kettles, not pets. And uh, when you want to scale up then your system, when you want to add another project or when you have more jobs to run, then uh, you just add another cow um, and then, or more, uh, just more other cows and then your hopefully your continuous integration builds and your uh, integration tasks will then um, run more smoothly, give uh, the developers a faster feedback. And yeah, that's what, what we want to, to head for today. Okay, um, there are other uh, ideas that you then should apply when you're working with such an infrastructure. You should store your configuration and environment, not within the containers or within your continuous integration system itself. Um, it's very good to make the dependencies explicit so that you denote uh, what service is required or depends on what other service. We're gonna see this later in the demo. And uh, to be honest, of course, uh, these are not our ideas. We uh, stole them from 12-factor apps or other cloud, uh, recommendations, as we said, bring the cloud into our continuous integration environment. Okay, so there are some best practices uh, which we came across if you want to run your continuous integration environments uh, as we do now yourself, then maybe you could apply some of them. Uh, one thing that, may, that we find very essential is that everything is run in a container so not only the build jobs and the uh, deployables are containers, but also the tools that we are using and uh, the infrastructure as well is running in container. You, uh, you must, I would say, code your infrastructure. You have to write scripts. Uh, you should version control these scripts. And uh, it's even a good idea to build and test, as I said before, those infrastructure changes. Um, before you then bring them live and testing your system. Okay, um, what else should you do? You should write jobs for your maintenance tasks. For example, if you're building a Docker image, um, you, have, you should have a Jenkins job to do this. Um, you should use uh, standard images as much as possible. Uh, it's uh, very nice or it's very easy to, to, to program or to derive your own Docker images, but stick to the standard images as long as you can. And also use pipelines for your continuous integration tasks so that you can stop or can pause your uh, the continuous integration tasks and also 
uh, progress manually, for example, if the continuous integration pipeline says, okay, the acceptance tests were ran successfully, so now I would have a manual switch over from, uh, to production or to your staging environment, for example. Okay, there are some common use cases. I'm pretty sure you all know them. Uh, we are all coders, so we commit the code, we run the tests locally, we do reviews with our partners, uh, we want to continuously integrate our changes with the changes of our coworkers, and we want to test the whole application then. Uh, we want, uh, if it works, we, we, have, we want to have our artifacts in the repository so that others can use it or that we can deploy them from there to production. Um, we would like to deploy, of course, our beautiful application to a staging system, for example, for manual acceptance testing or for uh, finding, fixing a bug in a version that the customer just <coughs> reported to us. And uh, what else do we want to do? Of course, we, when, we get a new, when we acquire a new project, we want to enroll this in our continuous integration environment very fast and uh, without any hassles. And of course, when we have a new project, maybe it comes running and then we have to scale it. Okay, and all of these tasks we would like to cover today and Rana will show how to do this in this system. Okay. So, uh, get a couple of things to cover. Uh, those are the tools uh, that uh, we're gonna use. Uh, the, the source code repository we're gonna use a Garrett here. This is basically GitHub for your home. Um, where we do, oops, sorry about that. Where we do code reviews and um, also here we have a Jenkins server, continuous integration server, which will build all the changes that the co uh, developers commit, and it will verify that those changes are good. And only once they are good, they can be merged into master. Um, as uh, Wolfgang already outlined, we have an artifactory or an artifact repository. We are going to use. Nexus OSS for that, so the open source version of Nexus. It's got the benefit of also being able to host Maven artifacts as well as Docker images, which is kind of nice. And so, yeah, we're going to pull this up all in the remaining time that we have. So uh, let's get started. Um, we already said everything runs into containers. Um, our built jobs run in a container. You, you want to be able to have uh, different environments. You want to have your Node.js uh, builds work side by side to your Java 7, your Java 8 builds, and so on and so forth. Uh, we're going to use uh, an orchestration system, which will basically uh, make sure that uh, it distributes all of those containers that we are going to launch on, on the, the various hosts that we provide to the system. And then Jenkins will automatically build everything and, and help us with deployment as well. Uh, there's a couple of rancher features. I'm not going to cover those in, in detail. Uh, the, your takeaway should be rancher is container as a service. Basically, we just say, please run a container or please run a stack, which is a set of containers, and then rancher figures out the rest. Uh, the demo setup that we want to cover today is basically uh, on my laptop. I've got two hosts. Obviously, you can scale that horizontally. Um, I've got two hosts here, and on the, uh, on the host one, oh. on host one, I've got a demo cache repository, so that we don't need to download the whole internet while we're here on the, uh, in the talk. And on the host two, then basically everything else will run. We have um, the Garrett, which is the Skit repository. Uh, we have a Jenkins uh, master, which basically controls all the Jenkins. Uh, jobs, and then there is a Jenkins agent that will run on every build slave, uh, and it will be responsible for then really building uh, the, the containers, building your Java files, and so on and so forth. Um, good. With that, uh, let's get started. So I've got, um, by the way, uh, if uh, you want to try this at home, uh, on the lanyard page, there is all materials um, here. It's all hosted on GitHub. You, there is all the scripts that you need to create your machines and deploy, and also the demo application, everything. So 
Uh, this is uh, the Rancher UI. Uh, this is a Rancher server. Uh, Rancher has the concept of stacks. Stacks are basically just a set of services uh, that belong together. Usually your application has a database, has an app server, has maybe some other microservices, and all of those together form one application, which we call a stack here. And uh, then, as I said, we have two hosts, the, the Rancher server host, you don't see it here, because it's not going to partake in the distribution of containers, but it's just the controller, really. And then here you can very easily add hosts. Uh, we could add a host on Azure, on EC2, on DigitalOcean, and so on. But you can also add your own uh, bare metal host that it only requires to run Docker. That is all, really. OK. So, and, uh, so right now, there's a couple of um, Rancher internal services that are running. Uh, they're not really interesting, so we're going to exclude them for now. Uh, but nothing else is really running at the moment. So uh, this is a completely clean setup. And now we're going to start uh, and launch our services. As Wolfgang outlined, we want to have all of the configuration, all of the um, everything that makes up our CI system. It should be in, in scripts. It should be versioned. You, want, you don't want to have someone change an, an, uh, a, a configuration file uh, at the weekend, and then in the morning, nothing else works anymore, uh, and you don't know who did what, right? So we want to have everything uh, conversion controlled in a Git repository, which was also what we have here. So the first service, we're going to start Nexus. Nexus is this open source in, uh, Maven repository. And the way that we do this is we enter up minus D. Minus D means in the background as a daemon. So uh, this is going to take a little while to boot up. And we can follow this here in the user stacks. And we already see uh, it's created a stack for us. And uh, for Nexus, uh, it's, it's only one container and uh, a couple of sidekick containers. Sidekicks are basically things that, we, uh, that contribute to the main Nexus server. OK, so let's see if it's already running. Uh, back. So uh, you see here, uh, Nexus um, exposes a couple of ports, and the web UI is running on 8081. And uh, the URL is slash nexus. OK, so it seems to be already running. And we provide, uh, you can see that also in, then in, the, in the GitHub repository, we try and automate all our tools. So what we've done is we have provided configuration files that are going to be automatically executed when Nexus is initially booted, which will set up all of those, um, all of those uh, repositories. So uh, for example, we've, cr we've created a private Docker repository where we will upload all of our Docker images. We've created a, a release and a snapshot repository for Maven snapshot versions. Uh, so ev all of those are already coded and versioned. Those, those configurations are, are versioned. And uh, basically, uh, and that's the, that's the challenge because every tool has its own way of configuring this, right? So uh, Nexus, basically, you upload a Groovy script, and then you have to execute that Groovy script uh, all via um, REST. And then there's other, uh, other tools like Garrett, which we will start right now. Uh, and Garrett basically has a couple of shell scripts and th that you can control via SSH. Basically, you log into your Garrett server via SSH and put some commands in there to create projects, uh, to assign permissions and stuff like that. And uh, that's how we, we do it with Garrett. So let's see if it's already up. OK, looks good. So uh, we've already automatically created uh, those, two, those two repositories here. And we've already done a couple of things to set up uh, the authentication, the version of uh, the verification, um, which then Jenkins will basically, so that Jenkins can put those check marks uh, if everything went fine with the build. And last but not least, uh, we have Jenkins. 
Um, and yeah, Jenkins basically is a continuous integration system. You can create any kind of jobs for that. Um, and uh, let's look at the, at the Jenkins configuration, which is quite, um, I believe it's, it's quite useful to see. So, let's see, oh, where is it? Let's try another one. What, unable to find, oh, okay. Um, good, and then let's look at it like this. And this is everything that you have on GitHub, by the way. So uh, if we look at Jenkins, uh, basically there is your trusty old, um, let's see if we can find an editor that actually works. Um, this is your trusty old uh, Docker Compose file. Jenkins is a little bit more complicated because we, we have those runners that will be run on every build host and uh, we have the primary server, which is the guy who controls everything. And then we see, okay, um, also here we automate everything, including the installation of plugins, so that if you need a new plugin, basically you just check in a file, restart Jenkins, and then the, your new, new plugin is there. Um, then we have a seed job, which was, uh, we'll see that in a moment. Basically we pre-populate all of the build jobs that we want also in a configuration file. And then, the, yeah, we mount a data volume where we will store all our data. And then there's this other, there's the description of those other services, but those are not so um, interesting right now. The other thing that is interesting is, whoops, is the Rancher Compose. Basically, this is an additional file to the Docker Compose where Rancher um, stores additional metadata over uh, for each service. And here, for example, here is this Groovy script that we use to com automatically provision Jenkins in the way that we want. Uh, basically, we're setting the email addresses. Uh, we, we are setting how we want to do with security. We are setting mail settings. We are set putting some environment variables in, uh, into that so that we can then use them in the build scripts as well. Uh, some credentials, uh, if possible, we always try and use a public key authentication. Um, and uh, then, yeah, basically that's all this. The problem is here, obviously, you need to know the Jenkins API, how to program that, uh, which is basically the, uh, quite a lot of work, but it pays off in the long run because then it's very easy to create a new version for a different project. And what we also here uh, have here, basically this is the seed job that we've talked before. So we pre-provision already a seed job, which is then responsible for creating the project-specific build jobs that we're gonna use in, uh, in Jenkins. So basically when J Jenkins has come up, uh, and it should be running here. I'm already a little bit cheating because uh, yeah, we downloaded all of the dependencies and we tried this out a couple of times and I hope it will work. So, um, and there's already a build running. So um, basically this is the seed job and the seed job is the guy who will create all those other jobs. We already have two jobs here, but I've got a couple more lined up and as soon as we run the seed job, uh, it will create those new jobs for us. Also, if you would wanna make changes to the existing jobs, then you would do it here. So let's take a look at the seed job file. Um, This is uh, pretty simple. Oh, okay. Let's try it anyway. Okay, now it works. Uh, there we, we define what are the other jobs that we wanna have, and this is the hourly job. This is what's the one that's already running right now. Uh, we set it up so that, okay, thank you. Uh, we set it up that it r runs periodically. It checks the SCM, so the Git repository for changes, and actually the here we describe what we want to build, what are the jobs that we, you should do, but how they're do, uh, building it is configured inside the repository next to the source code of the application because 
the team that's responsible for that application is obviously the one most qualified for, uh, for telling of how to build us, how to build this, right? The team should own their own, their own stuff and they, they're responsible for it building, for it running and maintaining it. So there's a couple of jobs that we've already seen. Uh, we also have like deploy jobs that will uh, deploy that solution to a uh, staging environment and so on and so forth. I guess you get the idea. So uh, we'll let, let the seed job run. And once uh, that has completed, it, uh, uh, it creates all of those other uh, jobs for us, right? So uh, for example, let's take a look at how, how this is configured. And uh, the configuration basically only tells it to grab the pipeline script from a Git repository and then use this script here to, uh, to figure out what to do for this build job. And as we said, this is then hosted in the Git repository of the application. So the developers are responsible for managing that. Good, so that much is clear. So we've got our, our jobs here. Uh, and this is a little bit of one that is uh, important. This is the Garrett review job. Uh, this is the way how Garrett works, but most of the other um, source code management sys or CI systems do it uh, similarly. Basically, whenever a developer makes a change, then this job will kick off automatically. It will ch check all of the changes and then give a, check, a thumbs up or thumbs down uh, whether the, the, the change is good or not. And then the, the, the code reviewer only needs to worry about with of the structure and the architecture, and he doesn't need to validate, okay, this is gonna work or not, right? So you have a fair degree of confidence that this is not gonna break the build. Okay, uh, so we have, a, well, here I've got um, an integration test that we've added, uh, or that we are running every time that a new commit is made. Basically, we're uh, creating a new product here, then we are calling the Okay, maybe let's make that a little smaller. Oops, like this. Uh, we're, we're searching for uh, products with the name test in it, and then we make sure that my test product is among, among them. So everything here is already uh, committed, so we're gonna make, make a dummy or a change. So our developer is very, very busy. So now we're, uh, I'm gonna use my git client here to, to check in this change. And then we're gonna upload this to Garrett. And the important thing, this is not yet on master. Garrett has this concept of virtual branches, so basically it's gonna create a virtual branch here, uh, and we already see that, ah, okay, there is something blinking here, right? So it's already automatically kicked off a build and it's running right now. And yeah, this is gonna take a while. Basically, for those integration tests, we are gonna use uh, an in-memory H2 database. It's gonna pull up all the tables. Uh, it's gonna run all of the tests, all of the unit and the integration tests. Uh, and then it's gonna check if everything's fine. Then um, uh, we, will, we will get a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Uh, the guys on Garrett, this is now the code review system here. I, I've got my demo change that we've just committed. Uh, can you read that? I can make it a little bit bigger. So uh, we can have a side-by-side -side view of what we've changed, right? So you can add some comments. Ah, okay, I need to log in. We need to add some comments like Okay, I can give comments about it. And once everything is done, we will get, uh, Jenkins will talk back to Garrett and say whether this has uh, worked or not. And uh, the font is a little big. Then you get a verified label here. And once it's verified, you can uh, commit the change and have it merged. Now it's merged into master. Right, so you, you always have the guarantee that everything that you changed makes it uh, into the master and it doesn't break the build. Okay, so 
Then, let's go back to Jenkins. So now we, we've, made, we've done the development workflow, we've uh, run all of the tests, and we merged it into master. Now uh, what we also have is now, this, those have been like tests that are only run on your in-memory database, but you wanna, wanna also do an end-to-end -end test, right? You wanna uh, test your whole application and make sure that everything works, that you didn't break it. You have your microservice architecture, you wanna integrate them, right? And have them talk to each other. So what we have here is a, an integration test or an acceptance test that will, uh, and let's launch it because it takes a little while, that will, um, it will do the same thing. It, it will build all, all the, um, the jar files. Uh, if you have more, then it would build all of those services. It will uh, create Docker containers out of that, will push them into Nexus, and from there, it's gonna deploy them into Rancher, and on Rancher, <laughs> Uh, the application is a very simple web application with a REST API. Then uh, we will test the REST API uh, and make sure that uh, everything looks good, right? We, wanna, we will add a product, we will check the counts before and after and uh, make sure that everything works. And this is gonna use the, the Postgres database, it's gonna use your Redis or whatever other system that you're using. And let's take a look at now at this Jenkins file that we already heard before. And uh, basically, uh, is this? We have the checkout phase, so it's going to check it out. Then it's it, it will it will build it with Gradle. Uh, everything, as we said before, everything is run inside a Docker container, so it's running this inside a Docker container. Then it creates the Docker, uh, the Docker images, and pushes them into our Nexus repository. Uh, and then in the acceptance uh, phase, it's gonna uh, do the same thing that we've done before, right? To launch our Jenkins services and so on. So we're gonna uh, up, uh, upload and deploy uh, the, this stack with all of the services, with the application and the database. And then, then we start another build container that will run the acceptance test, uh, which will basically test the REST API here, you could do Selenium or whatever other things that you need to test your application end-to-end. -end. And then it's gonna record all the, the results, and if everything is green, it's gonna be fine. And in the end, it's also gonna uh, pull down the, the stack again. So let's see how it works, or how it, how it went. So it, uh, okay, success, so uh, we were successful. We can check, so this is the acceptance test. Basically, initially, we wait until the stack has fully booted, depending on the size of your application. Spring Boot applications, with, which are a little larger, tend to take a little longer. Uh, then it checked the initial count. Since we always start with a blank database, before there were zero products in there, then it's added one product. Uh, this would have been the URL. And then it's deleted it again, and it checked, and everything was fine, right? So, um, Good, so let's take a quick look at what's running now. Uh, as we've seen before, the stack is torn down after the test, so there, it's no longer running here, but we still have our other services running. So now that we've built, we've also uploaded all the artifacts into Artifactory, and it's kicked me out, great. So uh, if I now check my uh, Docker repository. I, here I've got my demo web application that we've uploaded just before. Good. So now, uh, every, so we are, and we, we do those acceptance tests basically on a, on a regular basis. Every one, every two hours, depending on your project team size and so on. Uh, you can configure that how you like. And, but now we also want to actually see it, right? It was just deployed and it was torn down really fast, so we didn't really have a chance to see what, what went wrong or what, what, we, what we have built. So we're now going to deploy. And the deploy is basically just that snippet uh, in the acceptance stage, which basically just pick, pulls it from our Nexus and then runs Rancher Compose. and. Uh, and uh, we were too, too slow a little bit. So it's already started the stack. It's already available. Uh, the web application is running on port 9090. 
and uh, this is uh, our super web application uh, where you can just add random products. So this, as we've said before, this has pulled up the database, it has pulled up the web service, and now we can, we can use it here and, and play around with it and so on. Uh, all of the configuration for that is checked into the Git repositories, as we've seen before, uh, all of the changes that you've made, even if you make changes to your uh, infrastructure, right? So if you need new services, then you would add them simply to, uh, to the Jenkins file and to your Docker Compose, and then it would use those, right? So um, just to prove to you that we're not uh, lying here, uh, so I, this is the database, the uh, Postgres database from, from the from the staging system, and here we can obviously add another product, and here, it's, here it is. Okay, so uh, what you've seen is we've started all of our services, our Nexus, our Jenkins, our Garrett repository. We've provisioned them automatically with scripts which are checked into the source code repository. We uh, we set up build jobs that are automatically kicked off whenever an, a developer makes or tries to make a new change to the system. Uh, those, the Jenkins has built all of those changes and checked whether everything is still fine. We can uh, always see on Jenkins also the, the history of how the, how the, the tests looked like Right, so uh, Jenkins uh, records the history of our tests. So here we see uh, we have three tests, all of them were passing, and you can drill down here, check all the log files and everything, which is, in my opinion, the real strength in, in Jenkins compared to other tools like GitLab and so on, which Je Jenkins is super extensible. It's got so many plugins, it's got a nice, well, maybe a little bit, Rusty UI, but we, uh, there, there is also a nicer version, uh, but I think this is a little bit more useful. But it's got all of those plugins that enrich the functionality. All of those changes are, are, are configured in, in those scripts. If I need a new plugin, all I, I do is go into this Rancher Compose file that we've seen before uh, and add at right now, I've removed all of the plugins because I don't, didn't want to download them, but if I wanted to get the HTTP request plugin, I would just uh, write it here, save it, commit it. I can push this commit then also ah. into a review so that another guy on the ops team or whatever uh, can take a look at it and A, then he knows about, uh, about the change, so if I go on vacation, he knows about it as well. And, uh, then this also basically have, you have the visual verification that someone else has seen it and approved your change. You can then also do branches, obviously. You could try out other configurations, other plugins and so on, do blue-green blue stuff in, in Rancher. It is very easy to set up new environments. Right now I only have the default environment, but there I can test up uh, other configurations in parallel without affecting my, my other, my default environment and so on. So this is a really, really powerful tool for you to do all of the, those infrastructure changes here as well, make sure that they work, have a clear trail of what you have changed uh, and then being able to roll back if, if it didn't work out, right? So uh, we're really happy with it. Uh, we've spent quite a lot of work to, to get it working. Uh, Jenkins, as powerful is it? It's like uh, Batman with great power comes great responsibility. It's it's super complex. There is super, uh, different programming languages, different uh, APIs, different DSLs that you have to to know and and configure. Uh, but with this GitHub repository, you already get a lot to get started. Uh, and then I guess uh, starting uh, with a known good configuration. Will, will allow you to, to make, try out your own things and uh, adapt this to your needs. So, uh, I believe, yeah, then at the end, we're gonna clean up again, obviously. So right now, uh, we go back here. 
Jenkins. So we're gonna do our undeploy job. You could also do this from the command line, obviously. <laughs> Rancher down, uh, RM and then our, oh, it's already gone, I'm too slow. So uh, it's already removed the stack that, uh, that we had and the others are still working. Um, the nice thing with Rancher, so Rancher can do uh, the built-in Rancher orchestration system, which is called Cattle. Uh, it also supports Kubernetes and Docker Swarm. So if you, if you have Kubernetes in production, then you could do this in here as well. And this runs all on your own machine. So right now I have, the, um, vert I have parallels running here and I've got my two nodes. Um, I already tried out a, a third node, but um, don't have enough RAM for, for that. Uh, but this is, uh, this is how it runs on your laptop. But obviously you can just choose dedicated machines uh, in, in our system, uh, we, we, have, we are using Rancher OS on, on VMware, uh, obviously, but you could also run this on bare metal. Rancher OS is, is like boot to Docker. It's a really, really small Linux distribution. It's like 40 megabytes or so. It only supports Docker and really nothing else. Uh, but nothing else is really needed. All you need to run is this Rancher agent, which will then make that node available to the Rancher server. Okay. Pardon? Uh, yeah, you could actually, yeah, if you, if you, so now let's say we have five nodes or we have added five, five hosts here, so they would pop up here. And now we said, ah, okay, I, I need more power, right? More power, more power. My, my, my jobs are not running fast enough. Or I have more team members and I need to run more, t uh, more jobs in parallel because they're committing like crazy. Then I could go in here and into the, the Swarm client here, and then I just press here plus, and then it's gonna schedule another Swarm client to be run on C. Um, and it's gonna choose a, a free host where it's gonna do some load balancing ba based on some metrics. Uh, you could configure labels and so on to, m to make it sticky, right? I have a fast, a fast node with all SSDs, so I'm gonna choose this for uh, some data intensive um, jobs and then I've got a small team and they don't have a lot of traffic so I'm gonna label this uh, for th as a slow node and then can bind certain uh, jobs or containers to run on those slower machines. So I have a lot of flexibility. Also, as we can see here, Rancher is also giving you nice graphs and uh, so you can check the performance of the system here. You can see which container is using what resources. So, and it's super easy to get started. All you need is a blank Docker machine, and then you can, uh, then it's all, you, you run the Rancher server, and on another machine, the Rancher agent, and then you already, you're, you're already started here. Okay, so I think with this, um, we've covered all of the, the things that we wanted to get through. So let's go back to the slides. So we've seen that, we've seen that. So obviously we left out a lot of important topics that are still a challenge. So uh, certificates, uh, secrets management is definitely a topic you've seen. We've coded a couple of the keys into the Rancher Compose configuration files. Uh, you would also wanna configure your LDAP uh, configuration, right? So you, you want to hook it up to your uh, private uh, authentication system. Have, dealing with external volumes is, is quite a lot of work. So NFS mounts and so on. Doc, a rancher has components that will uh, help you there, but it's still quite a lot of uh, work to get, get it working. Um, as we said before, scripting all of those different tools, every tool has a different way of provisioning uh, and configuring this via files. Uh, sometimes you have to jump through a couple of hoops, right? With Nexus, you have to wait until the server is there, then you upload a file via REST, then you have to call another REST endpoint to execute the file. So um, this is quite a lot of learning that you have to do to, to, to set everything up. 
uh, resource utilization, image sizes, and so on. Cleanup is definitely always a topic because, uh, yeah, if you do this all of the time, then you have to also think about how do I get rid of stuff that I don't need any longer because otherwise it's going to just uh, fill up all of your um, hard disks that you have lying around. Auto scaling uh, is currently not, uh, so we haven't done anything to support auto scaling here. You've seen we've, we've clicked this button to just scale up the instances. Uh, everything in Rancher is, is a REST API, so obviously you could hook up your own. You can call a REST endpoint to find out monitoring data and then figure out, okay, this host is running uh, high on, on resources. It's, we would, um, we need to add another host or we, we need to do something to, to, to scale this up, right? Uh, monitoring alerting is a completely different topic. Uh, Rancher gives you good tools to visually scan what's going on, but you would need to then hook up some kind of external system. Uh, build performance and Gradle downloads is definitely something to think about. Uh, <coughs> Initially, when the nodes are blank, uh, it's going to download the whole internet uh, on if you're running a Spring Boot application. So this is going to take a... We had great fun in, in the hotel last night uh, getting all of the artifacts downloaded. Uh, so you, you, can, you need to think about how you deal with it. <laughs> Hopefully, wherever your server is located, you have better connection. Uh, we, in this demo, uh, we also used Nexus to cache the Maven central artifacts, so which is why this goes a little, uh, this goes way faster. But the initial filling of that cache is also something that you need to think about, and you need to configure all of your projects so that that they make use of this cache, because otherwise they're gonna always, for every build, it's gonna try and download a, a lot of stuff from the internet. So this is what we have shown you. This is all open source. It's all free. You only need to provide your own machines or rent some machines in the cloud. It doesn't really matter if you go to Azure or Google or whoever your vendor of choice is. And this is what we said with vendor independence. We don't want to get locked in uh, to a single provider. They make it uh, very, very attractive and easy, right? You only need to have your .travis.yaml file, and everything is going to work automatically. All, all you only add your GitHub URL, and everything is magic. I have a couple of open source projects, uh, and I've hooked up those uh, some other competitors to Travis, and two of them already went bankrupt. So um, I all had to change this already a couple of times. And you don't want to be reliant for your company's projects on, on stuff like that. However, uh, to be fair, there's a couple of solutions that make it very, e very easy. GitLab uh, is one of them. OpenShift IO, they've already, they just announced last week that they, they will have an in-the-cloud CI. They even provide you with a development environment. So the developer basically has his Eclipse or IntelliJ in the browser, and they can use all the remote resources from there. Not sure how, how I would like that, but uh, it's there. They, they offer that. Heroku just announced this yesterday, their Heroku CI system. Docker has Docker Cloud, which is also very similar. They often integrate an, a, rep, um, a Docker repository along with it, which even does like automatic builds when the dependencies have changed. So if you're uh, depending on Java 8, uh, then you could configure it so that it will automatically build your new uh, your new uh, Docker images when doc Java 8 has changed and so on. Um, but this is something that you need to figure out uh, and decide whether you want that or not. They, as I said, those solutions give you a lot of um, functionality right out of the gate, but there's always some trade-off, right? Either a vendor lock-in or maybe not all the features. Uh, so you need to pick a, a vice uh, you make a, need to make a wise decision here. And this is what we've chosen with Rancher. Uh, the good thing is that if you do all of that, you really understand how those other systems work and what they had to do to make it work. So uh, for us, it wouldn't be a huge problem to change now from Rancher to uh, some Kubernetes version or whatever. So this is just a small step for us. And uh, we are still really flexible, and we, can, we are agile and can make decisions really, really fast. 
Okay, with that, uh, we're done. Uh, those are the links to GitHub. Um, there is the presentation, the demo project. Uh, take a look at the demo project. Uh, we're we using REST Assert for doing the REST API verification. I think that's quite, quite a nice solution, which I haven't seen so much in the conference right now. But uh, there's a little, few little gems, and it's still super, super small. And yeah, uh, the other things on the Lanyard page, you, you see all the details, all the links to all of the stuff. And we will also provide you with the, sh uh, with the slides uh, on, on Lanyard. With that, thank you. for your, And if you have got any questions, then please shoot. Or otherwise, then have a great lunch. <laughs>